Okay, welcome back everybody. The final speaker today is Steve Pakala, the Frederick D. Petrie Professor in Ecology and Evolutionary Bi Biology at Princeton University and the former director of the Princeton Environmental Institute. The title of Steve's talk is The Interplay Between Human Interactions and Earth System Responses. Over to you, Steve. All right, thank you everyone. Um, the title I was given is The Interplay Between Human Actions and Earth System Responses. And I've added constraints on uh, natural climate solutions. Um, <clears throat> there, I'm gonna, I, I took this mandate quite broadly and um, I'm gonna talk about um, all kinds of global feedbacks. Now, the first thing I wanna do is, is to just um, uh, um, make very clear that I'm not gonna be talking um, about stopping tropical deforestation, even though I think of that as part of natural climate solutions. Uh, that's a win, 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 right? It's good for biodiversity and it's good uh, for the climate. And um, you can see there's five and a half gigatons uh, of it per annum, and uh, uh, that's just all good. Um, but it's also true that um, however problematic natural climate solutions are, they're pretty essential if we were to try to use uh, um, existing technology to solve the carbon and climate problem by going all the way to net zero. Um, the top, the figure on the left there is a, is a, one of many, many possible figures showing a trajectory to net zero. This is about a two degree scenario um, and it's one from UNEP. And the blue underneath um, is, is negative emissions that you need. And of course, negative emissions at scale, the only option we have currently is um, the set of natural uh, climate solutions. And these have got to be one tenth to one fifth of current emissions that, that must be negative at mid-century. And that's true whether or not you look globally or you look in the United States. And so however limited natural climate solutions are, we really do need them, right? So as you've heard in many previous talks, um, many have estimated enormous potential, all right? The top bar there from the Griscom et al. study um, goes all the way to 10 gigatons of CO2 per annum. If you look in the fine print, that requires that people uh, globally become um, almost entirely vegetarian, but nonetheless, it's a big number. Um, the second uh, um, paper listed here is the Bastien et al. paper in science that said we could probably reforest an additional billion hectares uh, of, uh, of land using natural climate solutions. And it it admittedly, all these are, just, are, are, are offered with caveats, right? So Bastian et al. said this was an upper bound and Griscom et al. said this was an upper bound, but these are the numbers that stick in people's minds. We've already heard about Indigo Ag and the Terraton Initiative, um, uh, David P uh, uh, Perry's uh, uh, famous video in which he's talking about storing a teraton in agricultural soils. I've got a different take on indigo at the end that comes from just the last few weeks though that I'll share with you a little bit later on in the talk. Um, I think there's some real opportunity there. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna cover permanence, additionality, and leakage, even though I know they're important, but I, it was because I knew everybody else would, or a lot of other speakers would talk about them. And I will just kind of dog paddle over the deep waters of biophysical feedbacks that might limit natural climate solutions, competition for land among forest planting, food production, biodiversity preserves, and biofuels, uh, links between food prices, suffering, and violence, um, incomplete knowledge to realize the full potential for negative emissions by agricultural soils. And this, recapitulates a lot of what David Lobel just said, this number four in particular. Number five, the potential danger of popular net zero policies like an economy-wide price on carbon and safe levels of natural climate solutions deployment given current knowledge. So uh, let's start with biophysical feedbacks. Um, the, the sort of most famous one I think of as due to a guy named Gordy Bonin at uh, the Natural, National Center for Atmospheric Research, 
but um, it actually traces uh, much earlier than that. One of the things that people don't um, talk about much um, because it sounds dangerous to talk about is that if you take a climate model and all of a sudden snap your fingers and remove the boreal forest, the planet cools a lot. And it's because you turn the surface from kind of dark green to white over large portions of the year. And that white surface reflects a lot of energy back into space. And it gets a lot colder, especially locally and especially in the spring. All right, it gets, you know, way colder. And, and um, this is a, a reflection of the fact that boreal forests, if you do forest planting in the far north, it actually warms the planet from this change in reflectivity more than it cools the planet from absorbing carbon dioxide. So that's a big biophysical feedback that limits where we can, uh, can do forestry. These forces sort of balance, not completely, but they're closer to balanced in the temperate zone. In the tropics, it's all wind. They absorb CO2 and the strong evaporative cooling uh, uh, dominates there. These kinds of climate effects um, go beyond the boreal forest, but not really at global scales. So that there are two other scales in which these have been talked about. Turns out that if you do a um, half continent scale push for reforestation, same is true incidentally if you um, stick up wind turbines on a half continent scale, you, you all of a sudden have when the forest starts a change in um, uh, the height of the stuff that's interfering with airflow on the planet. And that causes the air to tumble. And it sets up uh, climate anomalies that are, you can think of them as a degree Fahrenheit, cooler and warmer on either side of this divide that extend quite a ways. And so there are these sort of regional effects that come from continental scale, um, uh, large scale reforestation efforts that are on the order of a, of a degree Fahrenheit as, as a maximum. Uh, there are also in implications for rainfall. So these are, these are there, but they aren't in any way showstoppers, and those don't really affect things globally. It used to be thought that patches of forest that were like 60 miles across in a, say, a tropical grassland would also set up convection cells, set up weather much the way the land-sea breeze works um, on, on the coast because of the difference between the temperature of the water and the temperature of the land. Uh, but attempts to measure those impacts have, have uh, not, not verified them. So, so there are these important biological, uh, uh, global biogeochemical and climate, climate scale feedbacks, but they aren't, you know, they aren't, they aren't the whole story by any means. Uh, this is Rob Jackson's work, another um, way in which reforestation has a, has a, um, a, a, feed, a feedback that's really significant is that the trees suck up all the water and don't allow it um, to, uh, they return it to the atmosphere and don't allow it to um, uh, go down the rivers and irrigate agriculture. Uh, the figure on the left shows what happens when you plant um, a plantation and how much um, uh, less uh, runoff there is. This is a big deal in some parts of the world already in South Africa. Reforestation efforts on the tops of the tablelands have uh, taken all the water out of the streams in the bottom and cause, cause strife between farmers and, uh, um, and foresters. Um, a second big and important limit is competition for land among forest planting, food production, biodiversity preserves, and biofuels. We've got at least three um, big environmental problems that interact and compete for land. There's the climate problem where, you know, natural climate solutions and biofuels compete for land. We've got the food problem where we're expecting a, 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 a two-thirds growth in food demand and that's got pressure for to maintain the existing agricultural land and to expand it to more. And we've got the biodiversity um, problem in which Already, the majority of threatened species are threatened because of agricultural conversion. So every one of these environmental problems wants the same land. Uh, and, and if you look at the solutions literature, um, there are often, uh, you know, separate solutions promise large amounts from the, from the uh, uh, AR5 of the IPCC. We get a lot of scenarios calling for something like 600 million hectares of new bioenergy. I mentioned before already that Bastian et al. talked about 900 million hectares of new forest. 
um, uh, uh, Tillman et al. And many, many. I just, I just uh, put Dave's paper up here because he's a friend. But there are many papers that say we need all our agricultural land in 2050 to meet the growth in food demand. And we have a lot of evidence, this from the Millennium Assessment, that most other rain-fed land today is already forested and habitat loss to agriculture is already the dominant cause of biodiversity loss. So, so you can see what the how the constraints come from many different places and particularly constraints on land for new forest planting. There's this myth in the literature of abandoned and marginal land. Um, I um, uh, chaired a National Academy uh, committee that looked into negative emissions. We issued a report in 2018 and we looked at all of these claims, trying to figure out where this land was. And the high published estimates count land that currently sustains half of humanity. And so a better assumption is, you know, better rule of thumb is that approximately no new land is available for re and afforestation, uh, except perhaps for land um, that comes from meat substitutes. But actually, uh, I think this is really very interesting. Um, and and uh, would, if you haven't talked about it already, <clears throat> certainly warrants more talk. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about links between food prices, suffering, and violence. The graph here is an index, um, is a relationship between an index of food price shocks and how much violence there is, how much social unrest there is. This is part of the so-called high N, that is high sample size, um, uh, 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 political science literature now, and where they use econometric methods. Um, to, to try to figure out um, large-scale human behavior. Saul Shang at Berkeley is one of the real pioneers in this area. So this is really well established now. There are all these studies that go all the way back to the French Revolution. You know, a good case study is the Arab Spring where uh, food prices all of a sudden doubled in part because of uh, uh, land conversion to biofuels and in part because of of extreme weather events. And the countries that rebelled had populations with disproportionate income spent on staples, like 50%, which then doubled in price so people couldn't feed their families. And historically, when this happens, people go crazy. Now, th these events are multi-causal, but the high-end literature allows you to compute a fraction of attributable risk for a particular event of violence. And a lot of the violence that occurs after after a food price spike is, is in fact caused by the food price spike. Integrated assessment models that predict solutions that, that sort of people use to come up with solutions to the climate models don't include these sorts of feedbacks. We, you know, our science isn't up to it. So we ought to be really careful and humble about um, calling for large scale land conversion that could, for instance, impact food production. Um, we heard a lot from David um, about incomplete knowledge to realize the full potential of negative emissions in agricultural soils. Um, I've got one graph here. This one is, is uh, one that we took a look at during the negative emissions technology uh, report to that, that, that academy study. Initial carbon stock, uh, or you can think of it as current carbon stock on the horizontal axis, sequestration rate on the vertical axis. You can think of this if you're a mathy person as a differential equation, dcdt versus c. It equilibrates out there at, to the right at about 100 years. The thing I want to call your attention to is how much scatter there is around the mean. Despite hundreds of experiments, many lacking, lasting several decades, which is an Herculean effort, we still don't have a comprehensive understanding of what kinds of agricultural practices store carbon and how much. And it's extra hard because the high variability means we have to know the mean, all right, to, to be able to plan a strategy. And so um, as a result, using everything sort of all in, we, we estimated in the, uh, the uh, negative emissions technology report, an upper bound, including biochar of three gigatons of CO2 per year and 90 gigatons total capacity for, for croplands and pastures globally. I want to turn briefly to indigo. Um, it's easy to beat up on indigo. I, I, uh, uh, they kind of came across my radar in the uh, spring after the uh, COVID uh, started the lockdown. And so I called them up because I, you know, I, I've uh, been an EDF trustee for years and was interested in the fact that like the gas companies, 
um, are currently in Europe, where they face a need to comply with a clean gas standard, to stay in the game, all right, to, 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 to maintain their markets. All of a sudden, they've gotten religion on measurement, all right, and, they, and they've all started measurement programs. They've got a big um, uh, 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 measurement release planned in a couple of years, and, and they're all muscling up to be able to convince skeptics about what their methane emissions are. And it struck me that Indigo was in exactly the same position. Their business model depends on being able to convince ultimately a, a skeptic because a group could go out and measure it the same way that EDF went out and uh, you know, we all went and measured uh, uh, methane emissions across the United States to verify what claims were. And so, um, Long story short, they're now actually working with EDF and they're really muscling up on their measurement program. I think this is important because one of the things the National Academy report called for was a Herculean uh, uh, experimental program to try to extend these practices to as many lands as possible and figure out what they actually do. And it struck me that here's a private sector actor that has a, you know, a selfish incentive to want to be able to do this well. And so um, they're muscling up to do it, you know, and it's, it's not just CO2, it's all the gases. And so more power to them. I'm going to be a cheerleader and I urge all of you who have expertise, work with them, not against them here. Final thing, um, uh, well, two, two more things. Potential danger from popular net zero policies like an economy-wide price on carbon. Um, this slide is a little bit out of place. Part of it is an advertisement. Uh, I've been um, working with a thing called Princeton's Net Zero America Project, where we've tried to do the most comprehensive assessment that's been done yet about what it would take for the U.S. to go to uh, net zero um, uh, over a 30-year period. Uh, these are a bunch of different scenarios, and what this shows is the demand for biomass. And there's a bunch of scenarios there that are all capped at the horizontal red line. The first one on the left is business as usual. So that's no, no climate mitigation. All the other ones go to zero uh, emissions net in 2050. Every single one of them bangs up against the cap that we artificially imposed, which included no agricultural land conversion. You were allowed to use lands currently that go into corn ethanol to produce biomass. And you can see that a lot of it is going into that light blue stuff, which is hydrogen production from biomass with carbon capture and storage so that you're getting a twofer, a hydrogen fuel and a negative emission. Near the end, there is enormous pressure to get fuels and actually to get negative emissions to squeeze the economy down to zero. If you double the cap, as you do in this scenario in the middle, the one that says B plus, you just bang up into the cap. And so that's tens of millions of hectares of, of land conversion. And so when price, this is a, just more advertisement for it. This thing is, um, this study is granular down to the county level. And so this is a map of biomass use across the country. Now, if you, if you include the natural climate solutions here, which we, which I don't have yet slides for, um, there will be enormous pressure on those as well. And what's to stop a price on carbon from causing large-scale dangerous uh, land use change, including over-reliance on natural climate solutions? Um, and so what are safe levels? Uh, these are my numbers. I'll just uh, say here in 2050, I say, okay, zero here for fossil, cement, everything else, zero approximately for the F gases. And we've still got eight gigatons from agricultural methane and N2O, which needs to be balanced by, well, the current technology is natural climate solutions unless we develop something like direct air capture. And the point is that that negative eight, almost all this positive eight is agricultural. And so the natural climate solutions that we would need to zero the balance, what they do is primarily make the land neutral, carbon neutral, right? Greenhouse gas neutral. And so you should think about natural climate solutions as not the solution to the global warming problem, but the, but, but the solution to the land greenhouse gas problem. Maybe we could make the land neutral using them. Same was true in the United States. Even this scenario is pretty optimistic. The one that we, uh, the, the upper bounds that we came up with 
in the negative emissions technology report uh, were a single gigaton globally possible from afforestation and reforestation, primarily because we're concerned about land use change, a gigaton and a half from forest management, and as I said before, three gigatons from agricultural soils, all in. So that's a five gigaton of CO2 total. And to finish, biophysical feedbacks, half a degree and no forestry in the north. Is, is what the answer is. Competition among land for land among all the different environmental uh, problems. The right rule of thumb is that no new land will be available for, for new forests. There will obviously will be some, particularly if we get meat substitutes working to change diets. Number three, links between food prices, suffering, and violence are strong and should make you suspicious about um, economics models that predict uh, how we could deploy NCSs. Incomplete knowledge uh, to realize the full potential of negative emissions by agricultural soils could be corrected by simply doing the, you know, applying the scientific method globally until we understand it. Potential danger of popular net zero policies like an economy-wide price on carbon is what stops dangerous land use conversion. All right, we need policies that would do that too. Safe deployment of NCSs given current knowledge, it's a lot less than 10 gigatons of CO2 per year. That's it. Thank you, thanks Sarah. Thanks Steve, fantastic presentation. Um, so we'll go to Shafiq Jaffer who has a number of questions. Shafiq, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? <clears throat> thanks Jenny. Steve, um, I think you raised uh, a couple important points uh, that I just wanted to touch on. One was, this unintended consequences and kind of how do we start to put it into the models? How do we start to actually build in some of this knowledge we already have, but are more in the social political science literature into more of the uh, physical chemistry science models, right? How do we start to bring these together? I think we're close from what you showed. Yeah, so, so the, the answer there is, I think, uh, this is an area where scholarship is actually coming rapidly to, to, uh, to capacity. The, you know, in economics, I, I sort of divide economics between modelers who, who basically believe that the world is a modeler, and if we only changed laws enough so it would be exactly like the model, then everything would be okay. And empirical people who I think of as econometricians who, who try to describe the world with statistical relationships, right? And, and the, the integrated assessment modeling comes very much out of the first tradition. And the second tradition is what's producing the high-end stuff. So, so uh, if you haven't met him, uh, talk to Saul Shang, Solomon Shang at, uh, at, at Berkeley. But there are many others working in this area now. And so I do believe that, a, that a, an empirically based set of planning tools is in the works. And you know, there's a big group, Michael Greenstone um, and Saul Shang are, are two big pieces of it. I think they call themselves the Climate Solutions Lab or something like that at University of Chicago. And so uh, th this is gonna fix itself. We'll have a separate tradition to, uh, to throw at this. And, and the second thing that you mentioned, which uh, uh, kind of was in passing, but I think it brings up the big point is this lifestyle change of trying to move away from uh, very intense agriculture for uh, things like protein, right? Meat and things like this, which is extremely impactful on the environment. How do you see that kind of, I mean, you mentioned it a little bit, which is kind of how do we uh, get the uh, naysayers to understand? How do we get people who are very skeptic that this is a big part of the problem going forward? Well, well, you've hit on another area of optimism for me. You're going to think I'm just an optimist. But, but the, the thing is that, that I've been really pessimistic about this for a long time because historically how hard diets are to change, right? So if we only decided that we were all going to go vegan, all of a sudden we can free up a huge amount of land. You know, the majority of the calories produced by land in wealthy developed countries goes to feed animals, not, not people. And, and um, uh, globally, we have an enormous amount of rain-fed pasture land that we could, and, and cropland that we could abandon if, if we only all went vegan, but you can't make anybody do it, right? Unless they're born Hindu or something like that, right? So, so what's changed in just the last couple of years, um, as evidenced by the nervousness of the meat industry, who are running all kinds of ads to try to stop it, is the... Uh, is the alternative meats industry. 
and the forecasts for the growth of meat consumption have just slashed all these different groups, Bloomberg, all these characters who are just business uh, geeks have now, have now slashed the growth of demand for meat. And I think this is a real perhaps opportunity to free some land up for us. And it, it's because it's something you can get people to do. It, it, and, and from a standpoint of kind of educating the people on this, I mean, we get all sorts of numbers out there, right? But how, how do you actually convince people that these numbers are, are real and to get that transition to occur faster? Because this is going to be a very slow transition to meatless if this goes even. Well, so, so um, um, I, there are a lot of groups working on doing this right now. I, I um, run a center at, at Princeton called the Carbon Mitigation Initiative. And we have a big project that's trying to, um, to try to quantify exactly how much you could do for the carbon problem if you, um, if you um, uh, uh, pushed meat substitutes along, uh, you know, on long realistic growth paths and then used the, the land dividend for reforestation. And so I think there's going to be a lot of scholarship that comes out of this. The calculation isn't hard to make, right? It's just not a tough calculation. So, so I expect there to be a lot of, uh, of this sort of thing in the literature in, in even a year or two. That's great. Already is a little bit. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we have a question from Ajay Mehta. Ajay, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, thanks, uh, Jenny. Uh, Steve, a, a really interesting presentation, especially the, when you start talking about the impact of carbon price. Uh, potentially having a negative impact. Uh, could you expand a little bit uh, further on that? Is there a particular trigger point in terms of pricing where you start seeing uh, some of this negative feedback loop or could you just say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, what I worry about is um, if, we, if we decided to take net zero seriously and all of a sudden carbon prices in some societies got high, um, that is, you know, two, hundred dollars a ton or three hundred dollars a ton say mid-century and you're allowed to do international trading uh, this starts to really look attractive to people who are running marginal farms all over the world and and I can easily imagine a, a, a rush to convert those farms to uh, to to afforestation reforestation efforts and and a resulting food price spike that would be dangerous, that would be destabilizing. And so I think we have to um, figure out how to put guardrails on, 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 uh, uh, on some of these policies. I think it's one of the reasons, one of many reasons, why um, more and more um, uh, net zero solutions mixes don't rely on any single instrument, but have a diverse portfolio of policies to keep any one from having a gigantic, unintended, concave up negative consequence. Thank you. Great, thank you. We're gonna try and squeeze in one more question uh, from Arun Majumdar. Arun, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Sure, um, hi, Steve. Hi, um, Arun. Hey, um, so I have a question. Uh, since your talk is about human action and, grass and, and uh, carbon, if you look at the carbon emissions from fires, um, by f it's about roughly two to three gigatons of carbon per year. And roughly half of that is from grasslands in Africa, and which is largely human based. And although the net emissions is low because the turnaround time is roughly two years or so. My question to you is that, hey, is there a way to kind of modulate that in a way that you can try to get negative emissions or actually prevent uh, the carbon emissions in the first place. But if you can tweak it, is there a way for negative emissions out there? Well, <clears throat> um, the, the first thing is that, um, as, as you point out, the, the, the problem is not individual fires because the stuff grows back. Right, and so that it, so it can net itself out to zero. So what, what you would need to do to create a negative emissions is to increase the time between fires. And then when you have a landscape that is, um, has fires in heterogeneous years, um, you can think of it as a, 
as a, you know, then there's a distribution of patch ages and that distribution gets older. It's an older mean if you can reduce the fire frequency. And that means the land as a whole gains weight, right? And so there's no question about it. Um, one could do this if one decided to, for instance, to reforest with uh, fire resistant species, all right? You could definitely do this, right? You could breed plants to, to burn less and you could decrease the fire frequency. You know, conifers are notorious. They're full of monoterpenes and all kinds of stuff that, you know, they're designed, a lot of them, even to have, to create crown fires, to burn out their competitors sometimes. And so broadleaf trees are really a lot harder to burn. You know, uh, the, the Northeastern deciduous forest hasn't as a whole suffered a catastrophic, you know, crown fire burn since the ice age, right? So, and, and you look at any boreal forest, and any, any conifer laden forest, and it, it, uh, it burns at a much higher frequency. Interesting idea, Arun. <laughs>